Thank you very much. Um, I've got a few people that I want to thank very specifically and with real gratitude. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for coming tonight. You know, subjecting yourself to an evening of North Korea is uh, not a costless, a costless choice, and I'm grateful. Um, but I am really I I incredibly grateful to the Pulitzer Center and to John Sawyer and to Tom Hundley, and also to the NTI for um, supporting this kind of work because it seems as if as the world gets more complicated and the problems that we're confronting are ever more complex, the tools that we have to be able to document and interrogate these problems become more and more threatened. And it really is in a combination of assets and uh, tools like the New Yorker, which is a kind of literary technology in its own way, putting these two things together is the way that we actually begin to get to the bottom of it. And I'm the beneficiary in this case of that combination. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight talking about it. Um, I'll mention uh, the obvious, which is a lot of people have, have asked me recently um, how it is that I got North Korea's permission uh, to visit and to write about it. And the, the truth is that the more pertinent question is how did I get my wife's uh, permission uh, <laughs> to visit and to write about it? Uh, the, the answer is that she is a person of heroic forbearance and tolerance. And I would, I would say that um, under any circumstances. But also, we'd made a judgment. You know, The truth was that um, I was going in the front door. I wasn't going in as a tourist or as a anybody else. They knew I was a journalist, and I'd spent months essentially trying to get them to let me in. And so we decided this was a risk that was manageable and worth taking. Um, but she wasn't all that enthusiastic about it. If she was, I think I had bigger problems than just going to North Korea. There are a lot of ways of talking about North Korea, of getting into the subject. Uh, we could talk about it as a problem of Asia, for instance. What does it mean? What are the implications for China, for Japan, for South Korea? Or we could talk about it as an American problem in the sense of what does it tell us about tools of our own diplomacy and the ways in which we've tried to address this problem over the last 24, 25 years. But actually, tonight I want to focus on one piece of it. Uh, I want to confine the focus for the purposes of this discussion, at least my piece of it, to the question of perception. Because in many ways, a lot of the questions we have about North Korea, particularly in its crisis with the United States, come down to perception. And what I mean by perception is, it, 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 frankly, it's a word that never ex appears explicitly in my writings on, on North Korea. But it really runs through everything when we think about the issues that it raises. It comes down to, you know, how do we, uh, on the United States side, how do we perceive the North Koreans? And how do they ultimately perceive us? What do they make of our motives and our credibility? What do they make of our technical capabilities and vice versa? And how do we, uh, how do we manage these two different perceptions of each other? And ultimately, how does that shape our decision making on both sides? And I focus on perception because really it gets to the core of the problem of brinkmanship. If you go back to the origins of uh, nuclear deterrence theory and you look at the work of Thomas Schelling, who was the great pioneer in deterrence theory, Schelling told us that brinkmanship really is about manipulating the shared risk of war, by which he meant share, manipulating the way in which our adversaries perceive our willingness to use the ultimate weapon, to bear the costs, the, the practical and the moral costs that come with doing that. And Schelling gave us this terrific image of that perception puzzle. He said, you know, it's not as if two nuclear states are like boxers in a ring that are trying to knock down the other. They're really like two mountain climbers who are tethered together, standing on the edge of a cliff, arguing. And the risk is not that one is going to willingly hurl himself off and take them both down, because that's irrational. Either side expects that. The risk is that the other one will stumble will miscalculate, will step too close to the edge, will lose their footing and take them both down. Schelling wrote in that context, however rational the adversaries, they may compete to appear the more irrational, impetuous, and stubborn. And I think it's fair to say that that's the moment in which we find ourselves now. Shaping perception has been something the North Koreans have spent a lot of time working on. Actually, to be precise, shaping misperception. Kim Jong-il, the father, late father of Kim Jong-un, put a lot of energy into misperception. You know, he said that he wanted his country to be hard to understand. His, 
literal quote was, we must envelop our environment in a dense fog to prevent our enemies from learning anything about us. And he thought that that kind of mystery was a form of protection. And, you know, he practiced this in his own life. He only allowed his voice to be heard by the public once during a military parade in 1992. He was incredibly secretive about his own affairs. <clears throat> and he was pretty successful at the art of ob obfuscation. You know, reporters, journalists, intelligence officials found it to be an incredibly hard target. And when reporters went, for instance, with uh, Madeleine Albright in, in 2000, uh, they were put on a bus with curtains on the windows and they were told, never lift up your camera. You're not here to write about North Korea, you're here to write about Madeleine Albright. Today, the constraints are a little bit more subtle. Um, North Korea let me in and then a few weeks later, they let in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times for a reason. And, and I think ultimately that reason, it's always a little hard to know, but that reason is that they decided that they had to get their point of view out there. They don't trust us. They don't think that reporters are a particularly reliable bunch, but they realized that was the only way that they were going to be able to tell the world how they looked at this crisis. So they let us in with limits. I mean, to state the obvious, anytime I left my hotel room, there was a minder with me, usually two. Um, and I assumed that everything I did, any email that I sent, any phone call that I made outside the country, I couldn't make any phone calls in the country, were being monitored. Um, and the truth was that, you know, there's a temptation in a moment like that to say, well, maybe I can get the unfiltered version if I step outside of these constraints that they've created. It's easy to do. All you do would, would be to leave the hotel or do something. But the reality is that would imperil any North Korean who I encountered, anybody who was, uh, who made the mistake of talking to me. And of course, it would also put me and, and those who had allowed me to come there at risk. But more to the point, what I was actually interested in was not escaping government officials. It was in fact, I was interested in interrogating government officials. I mean, I'd been there once as a tourist in North Korea in tourist, really as a journalist in 2005. And in that case, because I was going in as a, as a, as a, under the heading of a tourist, I had no contact with the government in any sort of useful way. They were there all the time, but I couldn't actually ask them any questions. This was very different. This was a case where we could go in and spend, I could spend five days essentially on a kind of um, uh, sort of uh, road trip within Pyongyang and a, and a little bit outside the capital with a group of foreign ministry officials and analysts and a little bit of time with the Korean People's Army. And that's what I wanted to do because I wanted to understand how do they make decisions about us? How do they make decisions about their nuclear arsenal, about their weapons program? What do they make of us? What do they think of us in the United States? And ultimately, how do they calculate the risks and the costs of war? Because that's really what we're talking about. And in the end, you know, I had a lot of interviews with people who uh, were of some stature and they would present these people with great fanfare. But the most interesting interviews, as is often the case, were not with the people of the highest level, but they were the people who were the most authentic in their presentation. And particularly, I'm going to just tell you briefly about one guy that I spent time with named Pak Song Il, who was a foreign ministry analyst and is based in Pyongyang. And his job is to be in charge of analyzing the United States, trying to understand what America's intentions are towards North Korea. And Pak's job is specifically about analyzing the presidency and trying to understand Donald Trump. And Pac told me that recently it's become more demanding. <laughs> he, said, he said, when your president speaks, I have to figure out what he means and what his next move will be. This, he said, is very difficult. <laughs> I said, well, congratulations. You now know what it feels like to be an American. Actually, we're all, we've found something that pulls us together. But Pak is actually a very interesting figure. You know, he's 35 years old, married, has a son who's five. And he was always dressed in a crisp white shirt, a short sleeve button down, and he had a badge of Kim Il-sung over his heart. Sometimes he would have Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il together. I never figured out why he decided to wear one pin over another. But anybody over the age of 16 in North Korea is expected to wear a pin of one of the late leaders, and he did so. 
And Park, unlike most people in North Korea, had actually traveled a little bit outside the country. He'd had this opportunity because he was a foreign ministry official. And when he described the outside world to me, he described it in terms of cleanliness. He said he had visited several countries, Switzerland, very clean, Belgium, not so clean, <laughs> Bangladesh, not clean at all. And he said he'd been to the United States once in 2005 when he went to Utah, which is clean. <laughs> and over the course of a week, I basically had this chance to try to begin to form an impression of, of how Pac perceives the outside world. Not just Pac, obviously the system. What do they really make of us in the US? And to Pac, the most important questions, the things that quite literally keep him up at night, are questions including, is the American public ready for war? Does the Congress want a war? Does the American military want a war? And even though he was in, in some ways one of the most urbane and connected members of the North Korean elite, this is one of the few people in the country who has access to the internet because his work requires it, it was quite striking the degree to which he misunderstands some important facts about America because he's looking at it, after all, from afar, looking at it through a kind of fog. And he said to me once, the United States is a divided country. It has no appetite for war. And on some level, he's right. We are obviously a divided country. The numbers tell us that. Just look at our election results. And he's right in the sense that we have no appetite for war after 15 years of fighting in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. But if he thinks that that is the most significant hedge against America taking military action in the Korean Peninsula, that's a catastrophic misreading of our system. And it was a reminder to me of how much you can think you understand about your adversary, but when you are separated in the way that Pak is from our system, there was just a tremendous amount that he doesn't understand about us. Another crucial point that I think came through in our dealings is that the North Koreans in many ways take us at our word at times when we talk about military options. And there was an insightful moment, a sort of unsettling moment over lunch one day when Pak said, I was, we were talking about the possibility of a nuclear exchange and the ballistic missile program. And I said, let's just hold it right here. I mean, you know, as a fact that a nuclear exchange with the United States would be the end of your country. You know that. And so why is it that you actually entertain the idea? And he said, well, you have to see it in terms of our history. And he said, we've been through terrible devastation twice before, once during the Korean War and once during the 90s, during the famine, which they call the arduous march. And he said, and we could survive a third time. And that's a window into their self-perception. You know, they see themselves to the degree that, you know, Americans see ourselves as a country of a shining city on a hill. North Koreans see themselves as survivors, gritty, you know, they live in this encircled condition and they regard themselves as ultimately people who have triumphed above hostility before and that's core to their self image. But I will add that ultimately I concluded and this is a sort of a central point and we'll be talking about it more I'm sure that this is as much about perception as it is about reality. You know, when North Korea lets in a reporter and spends five days telling him that they're prepared to survive a nuclear strike, that's not by accident. You know, they're trying to convey a message. And the puzzle, and I don't pretend to have an easy answer to it, is how much of that is theater and how much of that is reality. And why is it that so much of what they showed me was, was obviously theater uh, in, 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 in simple ways? The fact that the, uh, they have all of the tall buildings and they wanted me to see all these tall buildings, even though the country has a GDP per capita that is comparable to Haiti. And, you know, the city itself is a kind of theater. There are no... Uh, you won't go to Pyongyang and find people in wheelchairs, for instance. It's a city that has been created for the purposes of foreign consumption. And what we concluded was that when we listen to what North Korea is saying to us, it's not that we can simply discount their threats, but we have to recognize that a certain portion of this is about perception. And I want to return now uh, to that central concept, that idea of perception, which is where we began. Because if there's one thing that became clear to me over the course of this research, not just in in Pyongyang, but then also, uh, fortunately, thanks to the Pulitzer Center and the trips that I was making to Beijing and to Seoul and the work I was doing here in Washington and in, uh, and in New York, I was, a, I was impressed above all by how much we frankly don't understand about each other. 
And this is not for lack of hard work. There are tremendously dedicated scholars uh, in the US and in South Korea and in China who have dedicated themselves to understanding North Korea. But it is a place that has succeeded in making its ultimate intentions hard to divine. And if we're going to be honest about it, we have to be humble about what we truly know. And if we can at least understand how wrong Mr. Pak is about some of his readings of the United States, we have to be willing to calibrate our own perception of our own perhaps misunderstandings. And that's an argument ultimately for diplomatic contact of some kind. And you know, we are in an unusual position with North Korea. We don't have an embassy in Pyongyang. They have no embassy in Washington. We don't even have a, an intersection in Pyongyang the way that we did in Havana even during the worst days of the relationship with Cuba. And that puts us into a kind of mutual blindness. And I heard an argument for that from an interesting, an interesting source, not a source I would have expected. The best argument I heard for diplomacy didn't come from a diplomat. In fact, it came from somebody who was avowedly not a diplomat. Jim Clapper, former director of national intelligence, spent 32 years in uniform in the armed forces. And what he said to me was that we are dealing in a position of extraordinary weakness at the moment because we don't exactly know what it is that's on the other side. Clapper happens to be also the highest ranking US official to go to North Korea in the last few years. He was there to negotiate the release of two American uh, prisoners. And what he found when he was there in 2014 was, as he put it to me, an extraordinary level of paranoia. They were living in a kind of siege mentality and very little of what they described to him matched his perception of the outside world. And that, he said, is dangerous uh, because uh, if, we had, if we have no function, if we have no facility on the ground, we have a very hard time gathering intelligence or gathering much useful information. And this is exactly what strategists mean. This is my final point is this is what strategists mean when we talk about the risk of miscalculation is the idea that we will make judgments. We never have a perfect information environment, but we will make judgments on the basis of things we don't completely understand. And I'm reminded of uh, the conditions um, that we were in in 2002. I, it's one of the first foreign assignments I ever had was going overseas in the run up to the Iraq war and then embedding with a Marine unit for the invasion. And I have to tell you, one of the things that that experience taught me was that we went into a country that we thought we understood and we discovered not only were we in that case wrong about the weapons programs, and that's not really the comparison I'm drawing tonight. We were wrong fundamentally about the kind of country it was. It turned out it didn't have the kind of structural integrity that we imagined. It was way more traumatized and divided and fragile than we ever imagined. And we are still to this day dealing with the consequences of that. And so from my perspective, this is not a simple call to say that we should pretend that North Korea is our friend. It simply isn't. But we have to be honest about what we can and cannot learn about it now and try to create the facilities to uh, give ourselves the advantage of knowing more, probably through diplomatic contact because the consequences of making the wrong decision and entering Asia without knowing what we're doing would be vast. So with that, I will thank you very much for listening and I'll look forward to our discussion tonight.